On Developer Voices today, we're going to be looking at another one of those programming languages that all the cool people seem to be talking about these days. It's Kotlin. So if you're a Java programmer or you work on the JVM in some fashion, you probably haven't escaped the buzz about Kotlin. But what I hadn't realized is how much further Kotlin reaches these days. It's not just a JVM language anymore. It's making a really serious attempt to be the one language that you write and then run everywhere. So it can take you to the back end and the front end and mobile and even embedded devices. I think that's really appealing. Write once, run everywhere. It's always been appealing if it actually works. And if Kotlin is a nice language to write in in the first place. So I've brought in an expert to discuss it. Coming direct from Google, we have James Ward. He's a product manager for Kotlin at Google. He's a clear fan of the language. And we're going to talk about why he's a fan, what Kotlin has to offer, what's its focus, what's it trying to be as a language. And then how does this promise of getting you onto every platform actually work in practice? And what happens when it breaks down, when inevitably this attempt to treat all platforms as the same breaks down? Does it have a way of handling that? Well, I've got to say, James has some good answers, some good reasons to believe that it will work. And so we get right down into the weeds about it and uh, kick the tires as much as we can in a podcast format. And just to cap things off, we recorded this podcast just as Google I.O. was happening. So he gives us a sneak peek into the future of Kotlin, where it's trying to go next. So if the promise of writing one thing everywhere all at once appeals, let's get stuck in. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices. And today's voice is James Ward. Joining me today, it's James Ward. James, how are you today? Good. Thanks for having me, Chris. Good it's to see you again. Great to have you. I haven't seen you in a little while. Yeah. Um, I So I've brought you in to talk about Kotlin, which I know you could yeah. talk about forever. But before yes. we even get there, I have, I've got to ask you about your job title. Yes. Because you yes. are product manager for Kotlin at Google. Yep. That's Kotlin right. isn't a Google product. So what's that all about? <laughs> yeah. So um, over five years ago, the Android team, uh, I think it was over five years ago, went Kotlin first. And this was really driven by the developer community around Android. They started doing Kotlin kind of on their own. And they're like, hey, this is this is pretty cool. We, we really like this language. And what if Android made that kind of the default, and and so they announced, "Hey, we're Kotlin first. Java is still supported uh, on Android, but Kotlin is the primary programming language." And so that kind of set off a chain of events: the the founding of the Kotlin Foundation with JetBrains and Google, and uh, and so yeah, uh, in in many ways, Google is is now incredibly involved in Kotlin's development, and uh, and some of that is driven for Android, but also Google has been using Kotlin on the server side. And so now there's there's much more interest um, in how just Google engineering uses Kotlin. And so they're getting more involved as well. That's interesting. Because I always remember Google as being the place that had C, Java, Python, and go away. Those were the only three. I yeah, think they've actually been swayed by users into changing that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many great language features in Kotlin that help with UI development and make the programming model so much better. And so, um, so yeah, I think it makes sense. And, and the, the reception from the community has been incredibly positive uh, around using Kotlin for Android. And, and so, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's cool that, that uh, this, this, great new modern language has has been able to to grow kind of organically in the android community and, and google as a whole 
so yeah, so I'm product manager for Kotlin, which means that I get to help grow uh, Kotlin on the Android side, but then I also work internally with our engineering teams and their use of Kotlin and doing a lot of things to keep in sync with JetBrains and all the great stuff they're doing around Kotlin and uh, and then working on, um, we, we have a number of engineers working on the Kotlin compiler itself. There's a, a big compiler rewrite happening in Kotlin. And so we're mm-hmm. working on that. And then Android Studio will uh, eventually use that new new Kotlin compiler, which is faster and better and more integratable and just a better foundation for the future. So, so yeah, just helping coordinate all that stuff. So you're not too busy. <laughs> There's a lot going on, and you yeah. know, we just had we just had Kotlin Conf a month ago, and had a bunch of stuff going on there, and then had Google I/O this week, a bunch of great Kotlin stuff we talked about there, and so, um, so yeah, just all all sorts of good Kotlin stuff happening around Google. Uh, well, we should get to the we should get to what's new in Kotlin. Maybe we should start with what Kotlin actually is. Do you have an elevator? Yeah, oh, pitch that's a good for... idea. <laughs> yeah, good. How would you characterize yeah, so... it in the landscape of languages? Yeah, so I think there's a few things that stand out um, for me. One is that it's it's a modern language. It doesn't have the baggage of other language. You know, as languages evolve, it gets harder for them to evolve um, because they don't want to break a bunch of stuff you know and yeah. there's different approaches to this i've as as you and i have talked about in the past i have done a lot of scala and i i think scala is a great language and it continues to evolve at a pretty rapid pace but one of the challenges with that is like how do you bring the community of users along with you into those new evolutions and so kotlin 3 i think or sorry scala 3 has been out for um, a couple of years now and the adoption has been I think challenging because there are a number of pieces that have to move along for people to be able to adopt it. They have to, you know, make potentially make code changes to adopt the new language. They have to get the libraries that they're using, compile their plugins, macros. Like there's just this giant ecosystem around language. Obviously, like that's yeah. what you want, and a language is a big ecosystem around it. But how do you then evolve a language and bring that whole ecosystem with you? And I'd say that, that generally Scala has had a, had some challenges around that. Um, whereas uh, Kotlin being I think it's like 10 years old now. Um, So relatively speaking for languages, not super old. And so bringing that ecosystem along um, doesn't maybe have all the challenges that that other languages have. Um, And then there is a a strong focus on, on helping helping the developers and the ecosystem move to new versions. And so uh, I don't, I'm trying to think if there's like breaking, been many breaking changes in the language and um, library compatibility issues, like don't seem to be as prevalent in the, in the Kotlin space. Um, So the new compiler that, is being worked on. One of the big focuses of that new compiler is for most users to move to the new compiler, they shouldn't have to change anything. And so that's just one way to like, all right, can we replace the whole compiler underneath everyone with something new without them having to really be impacted by that change? And so yeah. that's that's a huge challenge and takes a yeah. lot of engineering effort. I'm thinking of Scala 3, which handled that fairly badly, I'm going to say. And Python yeah, I mean, I, handled that pretty well going to Python 3, and that was still well, a lot of work. The the transition to Python 3 was, was I think, also very challenging. There was a few things that, that required some significant changes in the ecosystem. So the Python 3 transition, from what I know of it, did take quite a lot of effort to, to get that ecosystem moved. Now it's firmly moved and that's that's all, all great, but Scala 3 has not yet kind of reached that that kind of mass migration no. point yet. And so there's been some challenges there, but I love Scala 3. The, I'm using it, a bunch of projects and, and you know, there's a lot of really good language features in there, but yeah, bringing the ecosystem along has been been more challenging. But anyways, back to Kotlin. <laughs> um, there's, <laughs> we're, we're allowed to take all languages all on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So, so Kotlin has has some great language features that lead to better productivity, better reliability. So, um, just things like null safety being built into the language. Like, I think that's kind of becoming an obvious default for programming languages these days. Um, yeah, I really hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but that's something that leads to fewer production issues uh, for for people that are using it, and um, and then language features like the, there's a nice DSL uh, style 
way to, to use um, a, uh, it's called Lambda with receiver pattern that leads to a nice looking DSL. If you, uh, in places where you want to have more of a DSL look to your code, then you can use language features to do that. Things like callbacks, um, there's a, a nice syntax for that, which when you're doing UI programming, um, call, callback style programming is is an important piece. And so, yeah, being able to, to have kind of language support for that is, has been useful. Case classes to define your, your data objects uh, has been, you know, a, a feature that people really like. Coroutines is one of the big kind of headline features of Kotlin, which makes the async programming uh, much more straightforward. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's a type inference. There's a number of language features that just make it a, a good, modern, productive uh, language. And then, of course, Kotlin coming out of JetBrains has uh, a core focus of the language has been around IDE support. And so being able to have uh, great IDE support that, that is continue, continually evolving with the language has been important. Is that like a double-edged sword, though? Because I know if you so coming from JetBrains, if you use IntelliJ, it has fantastic IDE support. Mm, yeah. If you don't, not so much, right? Yeah, I mean JetBrains' focus is definitely on their tooling, and so so the best Kotlin tooling is in IntelliJ and Android Studio. Um, you can use VS Code, and there is a LSP um, for Kotlin, but because it's not core developed by the Kotlin team, uh, yeah, I think that there's some some lackings there if you want to be in VS Code or a different Any chance of Google which... taking on the LSP plugin? <laughs> I, you know, Google, it's a good question. Um, Google doing, because Google's doing a lot of Kotlin development internally, a lot of, uh, a lot of the engineers at Google are using, using Kotlin. I think we just hit 15 million lines of Kotlin code in the mono repo at Google. So quite a bit of, of Kotlin code there, but Google has its own tooling internally that, it, that it uses. And the, for the mono repo, uh, in Google there, you have to take a bit of a different approach to how you do code intelligence and and understanding code and so so for for Google's internal uses the the LSP doesn't necessarily make sense and so yeah I don't know what the how that future will will play out and then also like JetBrains is a, a partner in all this so we want to make sure that JetBrains is is successful so and their so, yeah. bread is buttered by having the IDE <laughs> of the world-class yeah. idea yeah exactly so so yeah okay. not sure what the the future of that is i think generally for a lot of the stuff around kotlin there there is a focus on growing the ecosystem and as part of that there's no reason why third-party developers can't can't build these tools and and uh, use them and um and so yeah i think that as the ecosystem grows the language support for other ids will will certainly grow um but, but yeah in terms of jet brands and, and google don't know if there will be specific uh investments into into alternative IDs. okay Okay, while I wait for um, a more up-to-date LSP plugin, you're going to have to persuade me that this language is so great that I should switch <laughs> to JetBrains or Android Studio. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're if you're doing Kotlin, it highly recommended that you use <laughs> use IntelliJ or Android Studio. You're going to have your best experience there, um, and so yeah, that's that's a, I think that's I, and I'm a long time IntelliJ fan and user, and so for me, that's not an issue. For for other people, they may be from more familiar with other tools, and so yeah, but but for me, that I, I love. IntelliJ. So I'm okay, okay, it's it um, it's it's nearly as good as Emacs. I'll give you that. <laughs> but, okay, so let's get uh, into some of these. Better than, I'm a long time VI user, so so I'm you know it's uh, I I don't often edit code in VI anymore. I'm pretty exclusively editing code in IntelliJ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it used to be like this classic war between VI and Emacs, and now we realize we're both basically on the same side. <laughs> against yeah, the yeah. against if that's the word against the yeah. ides of this world well and you can you can plug in the lsps into vi and emacs if that's mm, what you would like yeah. to do so yeah, yeah that's why i need Kotlin yeah, and to get I, an updated you know, I, lsp server yeah and i you know it is a community project around the lsp so hopefully that continues to evolve and um yeah the community drives that more okay Persuade me over to this other IDE. To persuade me to the dark side. What? Let's talk about some of these language features and see what's good about yeah. them. So, yeah. coroutines. I know you're excited yeah. about in Kotlin. Yeah, yeah. So we. Um, 
often in a UI program or in the server side, you've got something async that you need to deal with. And that's uh, oftentimes related to IO, right? You're, you're uh, firing off you know, a request to a server and then you don't want to block the thread while you're waiting for that to come back. Especially when you're on the UI, you don't want to block the main UI thread because then the user, you know, their their UI is no longer responsive. So yeah, you don't so want the button to program. freeze while you do an HTTP request, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And on the server side, uh, it's the the most efficient way that you can re- use your resources in a in a system that has async calls, IO calls, is to not block those threads. And so, uh, so definitely on the server side, it also is important to to be non blocking on on IO. And so, um, the in the world of Kotlin, you can use coroutines to do this. And coroutines give you a. Uh, I'm sure many developers now are familiar with the uh, async um, await style syntax, where you can uh, you can basically declare Declare that this thing is async, and then in Kotlin underneath the covers, that gets unrolled into the right like callbacks and, and non-blocking uh, stuff that you need. Um, but the programming model in Kotlin is is nice. You just if you call something that is a suspend function, then you can on the next line of code use the result from what you get back. But underneath the covers, it, it ends up being actually async. So it looks imperative: do this, do this, do this. But then it gets unrolled unrolled under the covers into the proper async constructs there. So, uh, and the nice thing about coroutines is that it's it, it's a language feature with a supporting library, and so you can anywhere that Kotlin works, you can use coroutines. So Kotlin uh, coming out of the the Java JVM space, uh, certainly you can do this on on the JVM. There are some alternatives we can talk about on the JVM that are upcoming Loom, um, but uh, but the nice thing is is that places where you maybe don't have that Loom style uh, um, or Loom capabilities like on Android or there's now many other places where you can run Kotlin. You can now run Kotlin on iOS. You can run it on the web. You can build desktop applications with it. You can build CLIs with it. So any of those places now you can use coroutines. So you get one async construct that works on all the different platforms. So um, we'll talk about multi-platform in a minute because that's another interesting Oh yeah, we should definitely get onto that. But, but yeah, the, the coroutines, uh, definitely a, a great, great programming model for doing async stuff and um, yeah, it's. Uh, I think now modern languages have, uh, I think, generally embraced the that style of programming for doing async stuff in in some way or another. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I. There's two different sides of coroutines that are interesting. One is the like. Um, request response style where you're you're calling an async function and get back the result but it, but it's async but then there's the stream oriented construct as well yeah. where it's called flow in coroutines and flow gives you the the streaming style syntax for uh, for being able to operate on a on a something that's not just a single result but but more than one result uh, and so you get both the the stream and the the function style uh, approach to to async and it handles both in the same mechanism kind of transparently, are you saying? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You you do have a different API for the stream construct. So in uh, coroutines, if you call a suspend function, then that's something that produces a single result. Uh, if you do want a stream, then you use the flow. And with flow, there's an API where you can emit things into the flow or you can then read out of the, the flow. Uh, and so the, like the, the Kafka uh, in the Kafka world, you use a flow to interact with Kafka. So you hook, you get a flow interface when you're reading from Kafka, or a flow interface when you're writing a Kafka, and so that's how you then interact with the the stream oriented approaches is through the flow API. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's that difference between like grabbing a single row from a database and processing an ongoing stream of stuff. Uh, yeah, I often yeah. think that's quite nice distinction between um http and web sockets say yes yep exactly and, and That's you want a great way to look at a request response or 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 a stream of of data yeah yeah and so the the um you can use also use a flow for a WebSocket, and so that's um, that in WebSocket stuff that I've built definitely will use that interface, and it's great because then you get one programming model for doing any stream-oriented processing. So, um, so yeah, it's, whether it's a WebSocket or Kafka or whatever, you, you use the flow interface for that. 
That's cool. So yeah, there's that's coroutines. Um, definitely one of the 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 really important valuable features of Kotlin is having that all kind of essentially built into the language. So maybe we should talk just quickly since we've mentioned WebSockets, HTTP, and Kafka. What's the library yeah. support like? Is it mostly go out to Java, or is it like plenty of native support for things? Yeah, so um, there's, as usual in the JVM ecosystem, there's a lot of different options that you could go with. And so on the HTTP side, all of the major JVM uh, HTTP libraries that are out there now have some uh, Kotlin support in some way. And so Spring is Spring and Spring Boot is really the, the primary one in the JVM space. And so if you are in Spring and you want to do async stuff in Kotlin, you just use suspend functions and flows just like you normally would and those integrate directly into how spring then handles the the reactive io underneath the covers and so um, for example if you want to do a web socket you can just do a flow in spring and, and that'll feed the data back uh, kotlin does have a like um a, a kotlin uh, native and native is the, the wrong word, but a, a Kotlin idiomatic uh, HTTP library called Ktor, and similar to Spring, um, you can use Kotlin flows and suspend functions, and then all the other JVM uh, major JVM frameworks have Kotlin support as well and coroutine support. So, um, so in some in the traditional JVM libraries, the Kotlin APIs are just wrapping the the Java APIs. So there's some translation to what's happening with the covers in in Java. Uh, but then in Ktor, you can plug in different engines, Netty, or they have their own uh, native HTTP library called CIO. And so you can exchange, you can interchange the actual engine underneath the covers, but, uh, but your programming model with using coroutines and flows is, is all the same, no matter what the actual underlying en engine is. Okay. Yeah, so lots of different options for <laughs> IO. Okay. Um, and then in, in the world of Kafka, um, there, I believe that there's now a Kafka, uh, a native implementation of the Kafka protocol in, in Kotlin. I think that it does not, this particular one I'm thinking of, does not actually wrap the, the Java API of Kafka. I think they, they re-implemented it. I might be wrong on that. But, but from my standpoint, when I'm doing Kotlin with Kafka, I don't have to know or think about the actual under, underlying protocol handling of that. I just you know, write my Kotlin code just as I normally would with Kotlin routines and all just work so yeah it's i have to ask for myself is is there like a kafka streams wrapper that works well i haven't seen that it, it definitely could exist but yeah i haven't haven't seen that okay that does lead into my next question my next two questions you can tackle these in any order you like because you've hinted yeah. at both of them <laughs> ffi and multi-platform because uh, yeah. Kotlin started out as a JVM alternative to Java, right? Yeah. So what's yeah. the FFI like? And we're not just targeting Java anymore, right? <laughs> yep. Take me through that. Yeah, uh, this is great. Yeah, so uh, in the world of, of Kotlin, you can target multiple platforms, as we mentioned. And JVM was the initial one. And so the... The interface between Kotlin and Java is bidirectional, works great. So you can you can interoperate with Java code uh, seamlessly in both directions. And that's been an important focus for, for Kotlin is to allow that. There's a lot of mixed Java and Kotlin code bases in Android and on servers. And so having that interoperability has is, is been, is been essential uh, and all works great. Um, Outside of the JVM, uh, the the approach has has been similar in that that Kotlin has made sure that the integration with the the native platform works really well, and so that's the the FFI piece, and so it's different. How it actually works is different for for each platform, but the the goal is to be able to have great interoperability no matter what platform you're on. So if you're doing Kotlin for iOS, then that actually compiles down into Objective C bytecode, and so you're you're running in process in your iOS app. You're not running in a sub process. So there are other multi platform technologies that that just uh, essentially like VM your 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 app, uh, and so you're running in a sub process. Process, and then FFI gets more challenging uh, and because then you have to bridge some way between that kind of sub process to to the main process and uh, it's not a native integration and so yeah that gets with, sticky yeah there's you know performance challenges to that and then there's just like 
a lot of times you are in a mixed code base. So on, in the world of iOS, you likely do want to take advantage of a lot of native iOS functionality. And in the world of Kotlin on iOS, it's, it's because it's just Objective-C bytecode, that interop is direct. And so um, there's there's definitely challenges to how that gets implemented because on the Kotlin side, you have to have a garbage collector and be able to like manage references, uh, you know, across the, those boundaries and yeah. still handle garbage collection correctly. And so the Kotlin native team is the one that, that has, has done all this work. You know, they've, they've made sure that that garbage collector works well on iOS and on other platforms. Uh, they, um, have been working on Kotlin Wasm is another interesting multi-platform oh, target, yeah, yeah. and uh, and the Wasm uh, WebAssembly uh, folks uh, just recently um, added support for Wasm GC, and I think this is still experimental. You have to like, from what I remember, in the latest version of Chrome and other browsers, you still have to enable the Wasm GC support. But Wasm GC allows uh, good pluggability and support for the Kotlin garbage collection to happen inside of wasm so um so yeah but again the native interop uh no matter what platform you're targeting has been a, a core focus of of kotlin uh and kotlin multi-platform is the the name for all all of the stuff that is kotlin beyond the jvm um and so yeah uh lots of lots of interesting pieces to how kotlin targets other platforms yeah and a lot of work under the hood to get it all working yeah yeah what's it sure. like from the from a developer's point of view if i know how to do kotlin ffi to java will i roughly know the right syntax for for to objective c so so it does there it is a little bit trickier in that case because you do need to have some way so let's say you want to call uh some native code within objective c from your kotlin code hmm. uh you do have to like generate the the stubs essentially so that kotlin then knows about the types that exist on on the the raw objective c side and so there's tooling that helps you manage that but um but yeah and then a lot of the a lot of the like the core libraries have have already are part of Kotlin multi-platform. So, uh, so in the case of Kotlin JS, they've taken the the JavaScript APIs and made them available automatically to you, uh, so that when you're in the Kotlin side, you you don't have to necessarily write that bridging kind of interop code. It's all just provided in the standard library. Now, if you're doing something custom, then you may have to to generate the stubs, do your do that native bindings. Um, Manually, but um, but there's the tooling that exists to to help you and help you do that. I'm thinking uh, same of something thing with like, like C interop. So there's C interop, and so you can interop to a native C application oh, okay. as well. It's similar that that you need to you need to have the Kotlin class that you're calling into, and and so that then when so then your your Kotlin code compiles and then gets linked together with your with your native code uh, in the right way. Um, but yeah, all that exists and, and is um, not too challenging. You know, there's a lot of other uh, multi-platform systems that I think are much more challenging for how you do that native interop. But in Kotlin, it's it, it's pretty pretty straightforward. And there's a lot of people doing it, and with okay. different di different platforms. And, Is it like and you know when you're um, if you're writing TypeScript and you want to use a JavaScript language uh, library that doesn't have type annotations you've got to kind yeah. of come up with your own annotation for the function signatures is it a bit like that? yeah it's a bit like that yeah exactly yeah. you you have to tell kotlin about what you're calling into essentially but the nice thing is is that because all the code's being compiled down to the native platform that interop isn't through a a um you're not having to come up with a socket way to do it or weird FFI system to do it. It all just gets linked together into the native executable. And so um, so that approach allows for great interoperability. But anytime you do interoperability across languages, you're going to have to do um, you know, some work to, to make that machinery yeah. all, all happen so that things yeah. can be compiled and linked correctly. I think everyone's yeah. expecting some work. And the question is, how much work? are they actually going to come into and how yeah. how reliable it will be once you've done that work right yeah yeah so i think it's i, I think it's going well there we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of use of kotlin on ios kotlin on other platforms it's been a little bit of use for 
Kotlin for like native applications. Uh, and that's like the CN or OMP piece where you want to write a CLI or something that, that actually is, you know, running natively on Linux, Mac, Windows, whatever. And so there are people doing that, not as much as on the iOS side. Uh, there is Kotlin JS, which uh, a number of people are using to do web applications with interop to the JS side. And then Kotlin Wasm coming up um, as being a, yet another target where, where you, you would want to probably do uh, some type of interop. The Wasm interop story, I think, is being um, defined right now through a, a, something called um, the Wasm component model. And so they are, the Wasm uh, committees are working on the way to do uh, interop between Wasms and different <laughs> languages. So it'd be interesting to see how, how that particular one plays out. But, oh, God. Yeah. I was suddenly yeah, getting uh, lots nightmares lots of, of, of different committees of trying to talk to other committees while they're committeeing their own agenda. Yeah, from <laughs> from the outside, it seems like the the Wasm community is evolving very rapidly and working together well, which is is kind of surprising for that. There's a lot of different folks kind of involved uh, involved in in Wasm, and and yeah, it, from the outside, it seems like that's all going well, and and specifications are are evolving quickly and and with with good coordination across different people who have interest in Wasm. And so, okay. so yeah, it's yeah, there's there's that's some rare stuff happening and on the uh, Wasm pleasing side. to hear. Yeah, maybe if I was in the depths of all that, maybe there would be a different story. I don't know. But <laughs> if we from the get outside, someone from the like Wasm committee is... on the podcast, and they can, yeah, definitely, they yeah, can tell yeah, the horror stories. Stuff, okay, so stuff anyway, uh, interop, right? So I'm going to go for a concrete example. If I, I can imagine, then I might write some Kotlin code that did a web server that was also feeding to an Android app, an iOS app, and a a JavaScript client. Yep. Yep. I decide I want to write all four of those in Kotlin with some yep. degree of code sharing. Yes. You know, there'll probably yep. be models, data models among that shared among all of that. Some UI components shared among the three front ends, stuff like that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. How painful is managing that which code can work where? Oh, great question. Yeah. So what Kotlin had to do around this was they had to create a programming model that allows you to, to take Kotlin code and be able to uh, target different platforms. So there's, there's Kotlin code that is 100% uh, able to to just the same piece of Kotlin code run everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would call Kotlin common. So that's Kotlin code that has no dependencies on any particular platform. And so it's 100% portable to anywhere that Kotlin multi-platform can work. Uh, and so there's a lot of... Uh, energy and and things happening in the Kotlin ecosystem to do more Kotlin common. Anything that can be Kotlin common, make it Kotlin common because then it's totally portable across all the platforms. But then there's places where when you're running in the browser, uh, you want to do something different than when you're running on iOS than when you're running on Android, running on the server. You want to have different functionality across those different platforms. And so the Kotlin team uh, created this system called Expect Actuals. And Expect Actuals are the programming model that you use where you say, in your common code, instead of providing the actual implementation for the different platforms, you say, I expect that each platform will have an implementation of this piece of function functionality. And so you you do the expect on the common side and then on, for each platform you do the actual side. And so uh -huh. the actual side is where you then provide the system the the platform specific pieces to that piece of functionality. So in uh one example you um, you have uh, in the browser, you want to use a JavaScript API to like modify the DOM, but then on the Android and iOS side, you don't want to modify the DOM because you don't have a DOM. You instead <laughs> want to like, you know, talk to a, a UI toolkit, which uh, Skia is the UI toolkit that is being used um, as that cross-platform UI toolkit. Uh, Skia is an open source um rendering toolkit uh, that actually Android uses to render on Android, but we're able to take Skia and use it on iOS and even use it in the browser with Canvas. And so then you get a consistent API for how you do rendering underneath the covers. And so in that case, you um, 
maybe you'd say, all right, if I'm running on something that's Skia backed, then I can just have that piece of code um, be the actual for the platforms that have Skia. But then if I'm on uh, rendering to the DOM, then I'm going to do something different in that path. And so you'd have a different actual for, for the DOM implementation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I can see how that would work. Um... Yeah. Yeah, so from from the developer standpoint, I'm still writing Kotlin code for all these pieces, unless there's some thing that doesn't exist in a standard library and a third party library that's already done the the uh, interop FFI you know piece for me, uh, and so in all the multi-platform Kotlin code that I've written, I haven't had to deal with the the interop directly because there's something that already exists for me, some piece of Kotlin code that are, is already doing that for me. And so I'm just, I'm writing my actuals in Kotlin. I do have to write them for each platform uh, when there are differences, but I'm still just writing the Kotlin code there. It just is doing calling a different API depending on the, on the platform that oh, I'm targeting. Okay. Yeah. I would have thought the challenging part of that is getting the abstraction boundary right. Because like yeah, a button so is a button is a button, but there are like a table widget has very different properties across the different platforms, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there definitely is always that that trade-off in multi-platform programming is do you try to come up with the common denominator across all the platforms, or do you really try to use what is native on the platform? And so so DOM versus Skia is a good example where the capabilities are not the same across the platforms. And then you do have to decide, do I want to try try to come up with some layer that that creates that common abstraction or do i actually just do the actuals on the platform and and decide all right on this platform i'm going to do this and on this platform i'm going to do this other thing and so it's the nice thing is that the facilities are there to go with whatever approach makes sense for you um, and you don't necessarily have to get locked into using a lowest common denominator uh, across all the platforms you don't have to do that if you don't want to um, uh, okay. but you you can do that if if you choose to. So JetBrains has taken the um, the Compose library, which is the UI library for Android, and they've made Compose work on iOS and on the browser. And so you can just write one single Compose UI and then target Android, iOS, desktop, and web all with the same exact UI code. And so that, that you know, if that's what you want, if that's the, the UI that works for you across all those platforms, then great, you can use that. If you did instead want to have, let's say, just your business logic shared across the platforms, but then to have native UIs, then you could do that as well using the interoperability, the native interoperability. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Because I could see myself to wanting to go for lowest common denominator just to launch and then refine yeah. it to platform specific for version two. So I could do that. For sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So nice. you can be anywhere on that spectrum and you can move freely across that spectrum. So if you decide, all right, this particular view in my app, I want to be native, then you can just change that one view and not change everything. So yeah. And then on iOS specifically, you can kind of even uh, embed in both directions. So let's say that you're in a, a Compose UI and you want to embed a native iOS widget, you can do that, but then you can also embed pieces of a UI being Compose backed uh, as well. So so yeah, lots of different kind of way, levels of of doing the, the integrations. Okay, it, this is reminding me of an old promise of Java that it would be right <laughs> once, run everywhere. And that never yep. really worked out, right? Yeah. Do you think yeah. Kotlin has a shot of achieving that promise i think that for people that want write once one anywhere they they can achieve that with compose multi-platform but then there are cases where that doesn't make sense and you do want to be native and you can do that as well so i think you know the the flexibility of of write once run anywhere or write some of it once and run anywhere and write and then have the, the native implementations for specific things, you can do that as well. So, so I think that's really one of the, the compelling things about Kotlin multi-platform is that you don't have to buy into everything being one way. Um, you can choose where you want and you can adjust as you evolve along that spectrum in either direction.
Okay. Okay. That, that does sound nice, and it sounds like they might have actually got it working. <laughs> which is yeah, you know, I'm I, certainly I'm I'm a, I'm a uh, I think that this is the first time where I've seen a cross-platform technology that doesn't come with the typical cross-platform um, trade-offs that that often have to be made. So yeah, um, so yeah, I, I think it's it it, it is. Um, a good evolution in the space that that I don't know if I've really seen anyone else provide that ability to to choose where you want to be on that spectrum and move freely. That's pretty cool. It's so, pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, that let me let me segue into a different kind of choice between two worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I know that um, one of the things about Kotlin is it's the, it's using some ideas from object orientation and some from functional programming. Yeah. I, I find that very interesting, but I'm not sure how well anyone's got the two sets of ideas to sit together in a cohesive whole. Yeah. So which pits has got them picked and how well has it blended them? Yeah, it's it's just generally with languages, we've seen most O languages start to bring in functional constructs in, in some way or another. Mm -hmm. And that's been a really great language evolution across many different languages. So Kotlin is, is one of those that has, has kind of uh, pulled in functional constructs in a variety of ways. It's not, uh, it's not Haskell, right? Like I think you're, you're kind I'm of a Haskell fan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know you love Haskell and I knew, I was so glad to have you on my podcast talking about Haskell and learned a lot on that <laughs> one. Um, Scala was, has been my primary experience with this like hybrid O functional approach. And, uh, and I, I think that Kotlin has done a pretty good job of integrating functional concepts in, but it definitely doesn't go as far as, as Scala or, or Haskell has gone uh, in that respect. And so, um, so you know, some of the functional constructs and, and, uh, that are important to me in Kotlin. Uh, one is immutability is, I wouldn't say a 100% um, default, but is much more default than in the world of Java. And so there is a strong bent in the world of Kotlin towards creating immutable values versus versus mutable ones. And so to me, I'm like, yes, like I don't ever want to write immutable anything if I don't have to, or mutable anything if I don't have to. Yeah. And so being able to easily be immutable and have the language and the library ecosystem really support that paradigm has has been has been good. And then just like functions as being a a first class thing, obviously that's that's an important piece. That if I define a function, I should be able to kind of pass the reference to that around and and do functors and all that kind of stuff easily. Um, definitely well supported uh, in the world of Kotlin. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, they're they're coming from Scala. There are things that I miss um, in the functional world. So so I miss type classes. Scala 3's type classes are, are really good and, uh, and, and definitely an a awesome programming model. And so, so I've, I've, I, when I'm in the world of Kotlin, I miss things like type classes. Um, i trying to think of other functional constructs that, that I um, miss. Like uh, Kotlin doesn't have um, uh, higher, what, what's the higher, the higher kind of types? types not higher is that, yeah does not have higher kind of types yeah yeah so it does not have higher kind of types and so so that's something that that when people get into kotlin they uh from scholar haskell they're like oh, i miss my higher kind of types and um and so <laughs> if, yeah if any but, listeners don't know what higher kind of types are there will link to the podcast i recorded on your show the happy path programming where we <laughs> talk we about go. it yep. extensively Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So higher kind of types are something that the um, higher kind of types are are kind of beyond my realm of of brain capacity. Generally, <laughs> I think that I benefit from them uh, with with good flat maps and and all that. Mm. Um, but uh, in in the world of Scala, um, but uh, I know that the in the world of Kotlin, those smarter people definitely complain about the lack of those. And in, in if we step one down, I am assuming Kotlin has generics like Java, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, generics, um, and then uh, inheritance as well. So uh, coming from the world of Java, you kind of have to support uh, support inheritance, and so yeah, it does support inheritance. And um, and then there's some support for ADTs, so you can do uh, something like a sum type with uh, it's kind of simulated in the old ways that we did it in, in Scala with a sealed uh, sealed trait or sealed uh, sealed class, and that allows you to do uh, exhaustive pattern matching on a sum 
type and that sort of thing. So, um, but Scala three's eighty two support is is pretty pretty awesome, and and Kotlin doesn't go that far um, in terms of their eighty two support. Oh, it sounds like you're uh, vying to come back on the podcast to talk about Scala three at the same time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 We'll get you back in six yeah. months and we'll we'll cover it. <laughs> Perfect. We'll talk about Scala three. That sounds great. Yeah. Okay. This- yeah, and then like the the thing in the Scala lab, the Scala ecosystem that I've really enjoyed lately is effect systems and and uh, using um, Scala Zio uh, for effects. And Kotlin doesn't quite have a way to do effect system or Kotlin doesn't quite have a way to do effect systems as well as has been done in in Scala yet. Um, there's a new language feature that is experimental called context receivers, and uh, the okay. there's a functional programming library in Kotlin called Arrow, and the Arrow folks have been experimenting with doing something kind of similar to an effect system on top of the context receivers, uh, the language feature in, in Kotlin. So so it's some interesting evolution in there. But if you want to do Functional programming in Kotlin, Arrow is definitely your your go to for for how you do that. So, for those that don't know, define an effect system. Oh yeah, um, so an effect system uh, for for me is a way to uh, to to separate out the pure functions, the things that that um, have no side effects, so not talking to the outside world, whether that's the network or even um, non-obvious things like getting the system clock or getting a random number from the system. Those are, those are side effects. There's some external call. It's not a pure function. Um, the, the, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but kind of the definition for me of a pure function is uh, if I call the function more than once, will it always produce the, the same result? Is there a direct mapping between inputs and outputs? And so with effects, we recognize that, hey, it sure would be nice if we could kind of delineate uh, the, the pieces of our code that are pure from the pieces that have side effects. Mm. And so the effect system gives you a programming model to do that delineation but then one of the challenges is that you when you're in the world of effects you're no longer working with a pure function you have some other construct that is that is modeling the the that uh that side effect that's happening and so all of the great things that we have in functional programming around function composition you then need to figure out okay how do i compose things that aren't pure functions but are effects Mm. and so uh and so there's some challenges to to dealing with with composition of effects and this is where Scala Zio has done such a great job of being able to um, to model the effect parts of an application and make them composable and so the the programming model uh, in Zio uh, it allows you to do some pretty amazing things like you if you've defined an effect but then let's say you want to repeat it or you want to retry it if it fails or you want to be able to race two effects you just get this really nice API for doing those sorts of effect compositions um, that are that are not um, functions because you're you're no longer in the in that realm of, of pure functions and so um so yeah this is uh, i i have been loving effect oriented programming and programming in that style in in scala uh and then testability so one of the things that you get when you model your effects is that then when you do your tests you can swap out the side effects for something that is no longer a side effect so that you can more effectively unit test all of your side effecting code without actually doing the, the normal side effects So moving from your integration test that would be talking to the live random number generator, which can be problematic in a test. Well, it turns out you can just like in your test, throw in an implementation of the side effecting piece, and then it makes it much more testable. Um, so yeah, that's a fun little tangent on effect uh, systems. Yeah, but. yeah. It's a, it's a bit like programming everything to an interface and then swapping out the real system for the mock, but just yeah. nicer when it works. I think. So much nicer. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> one more thing fix. on the whole, uh, cause we've talked a lot about UIs and we've talked a bit about functional versus object orientation. What, and we've also talked about um, Android, which must have a lot of this. What's Kotlin's opinion on the right way to do user interfaces? 
Yeah, so Compose is the primary UI for building uh, in UIs for Android uh, with Kotlin. It's a Kotlin-only library, so it's taking advantage of a bunch of Kotlin features to be able to create a really nice program model. It feels declarative, but it's just using that DSL syntax in, in Kotlin to be able to, to give you something that looks declarative, but really is just, just Kotlin underneath the covers. And then um, Compose has a bunch of components, and you can... Uh, you know, move, use those, munge those components together into what are called composables and build a whole UI based on your composables. Uh, and so that is the, the modern uh, way to, to build UIs in Android. And JetBrains took that Compose library and made it work on other platforms. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a new programming model. Um, yeah, no, is there anything else on, on Compose that's interesting? Um, to, Compose is, I I think that the programming model for me is is nice. Like it's a whole lot better than writing callbacks and you know the kind of older style of yeah. of building a UI. Um, but it's it's not actually very like functional. Like like there, I don't know if you've done Elm, but I love Elm's yeah. approach to UI programming because it is functional. And so there is for me there's some some things that when I'm in Compose, I'm like, oh, I wish this was just a pure function, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But and it's not. It's you know, it's uh, Compose is managing the state underneath the covers and doing all sorts of clever things to make uh, state state dealing with state efficient uh, to be able to get high performance UI and all that but um but it's it's a it's a different model of programming uis than than you would do in the functional world with something like elm is there is there like a comparable architecture if it's not like elm is it like react is it like using jquery is it like swing i think that probably react would be the most similar that i that i've experienced but i haven't done a whole lot of actual web programming with with many of the the modern web stuff Mm -hmm. uh like react or whatever so i don't know how similar it is to react but but it I, I think the main point is it feels declarative. You um, you have nice language support for doing callbacks, like when somebody clicks on a button, you need to um, do something to to, uh, to that, and then you can update state and compose manages. Oh, this state changed, and this particular piece of UI is bound to that state. We need to obviously redraw that piece of the UI. So compose does all that underneath the covers for you with that, that okay. kind of connection between state mutable state and and your uh, and the the ui that is bound to that state um so yeah that's that's part of the compose runtime and compose compiler kind of work together to to make that all work kind of transparently and efficiently is is i think one of the, the important points is like you can do this you can do this in a naive approach and I think have a lot of performance issues, but doing it in a way that works well for, for, you know, non laggy UIs is, is a bit har- harder. And that's what the, the compose folks have done. And I guess they're thinking about much lower power hardware, right? Cause they're working on mobile phones all the time. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely with, with Android, you gotta be thinking about um, the, the lower power d- devices that, that um, need to not use so many resources. And yeah. all that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the future then, having got a yeah. survey of the language. You said you've been at Kotlin Conf, you've been at Google I. Google I.O. is happening as we're recording this, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're making some announcements. On what's on the, yeah. what's on the um, future list? Yeah, so exciting stuff is the new compiler is is a big exciting piece because um, as Kotlin code bases have gotten larger, uh, that has put more pressure on the compiler to to be fast. And so the new compiler, the the early benchmarks that we've seen on on compiling Kotlin are that it's uh, around can be around two times faster than the old compiler, okay. and so. Nice. That definitely has an impact on on large code bases, and uh, and then things like um, when you're in the IDE editing code, you want to get code completion quickly, and as the code base grows, that code completion can get slower, and so just providing a, a better, more efficient way to be able to provide that code intelligence back to the IDE is important, uh, and so this is this has been uh, a big multi-year project of rewriting the compiler, and at Kotlin Conf, they announced that the new compiler will be the default in Kotlin. 
2.0, um, which um, I don't know the exact, I don't know if they said the exact time frame for that yet, but hopefully sometime in the next year or so we'll, okay. we'll be getting Kotlin 2.0 with a new compiler. So so that's that's great. That's going to lead to a, kind of just a better foundation for moving forward and much better performance. So um, so the, the code name for that compiler was K2 uh, and, and now Solid the, the, the new compiler in Kotlin 2.0. So, um, so yeah, that's that's one of the big exciting things. Um, other exciting stuff was there was a bunch of announcements at Kotlin Conf around Kotlin multi-platform. So the Kotlin WASM piece, I think that's currently experimental, uh, composed for iOS, uh, also also experimental. I think uh, so. Yeah, that, so there was a bunch of exciting things happening around Kotlin multi-platform announcements at, at Kotlin Conf. Um, I. Uh, was working on a project that we announced at Kotlin Conf, which is moving the default Gradle build configuration for the the ecosystem around Gradle from Groovy to Kotlin. And so that was uh, a good thing. It's like, why not have uh, Gradle supports Kotlin as the build DSL? And uh, and so aligning around Kotlin across JetBrains, Gradle, and uh, Google um, to, to make Kotlin the default was the announcement we made at Kotlin Comp. So, so that was sense. all good. I, I certainly like writing my builds in Kotlin. So, <laughs> so that's been, been nice. Um, so it sounds like the main then, thing that's happened is organizing for... Um for a larger future. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just in, in many different directions, whether it's multi-platform or compilers or, um, you know, using Kotlin in more, more places like in the build, um, just, just kind of, yeah, setting up, setting up things for a better future, but, <laughs> but also like it's impacting developers, you know, already today, like the developers that, that are using Kotlin are, they, they're generally happy, which is kind of weird. Like normally <laughs> in the language communities that I've been a part of, like, like people are grumpy and complaining about you know all sorts of things in the language and and i think the developers that are using kotlin are really happy with it they always say that they're having fun which is um you know good thing to hear for for a language yeah absolutely Um, it's it's funny how every language takes on a character partly by (laughs) the language and partly by the designers and partly by the community yep yeah yeah and i think with kotlin developers we they they seem happy. They seem like they're having fun. That's that's a good thing. <laughs> good, good. That's what we're here for. Getting stuff yeah. done and enjoying it along the way. <clears throat> I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely um, been been part of language communities that that just feels like a lot of thrashing and uh, you know a lot of like pounding my head against the wall in various ways. And and yeah, I don't I don't um, I don't feel that much in the Kotlin community. So that's that's been good. <laughs> That's really good. That that actually leads me to one last question I have to ask you. <clears throat> uh, one last challenging question, I think. Bashing your head against the wall, the hot topic right now is getting um, artificial intelligence to support us as programmers. Yes. Like, will we be getting oh. um, AI to help us write <laughs> Kotlin? And you're at Google, so you should have great answers to that. <laughs> you know, this is well timed because just yesterday in uh, the Google I/O developer keynote, um, there was a lot of AI stuff, and one of the pieces of that was uh, in they have something called Android Studio Bot, which is now integrated into the preview releases of Android Studio, and it allows you to have a chat-like experience to help you write your code or explain your code, and so you can highlight a piece of Kotlin code and say, StudioBot, explain this to me, oh. and it'll explain it. You can go into StudioBot and say, uh, StudioBot, write uh, something that will render an image for me with Compose, and boom, like there's your code snippet, and then you can pull it right into your code base. And um, so, yeah, that was um, that was actually the first time that I'd seen StudioBot was yesterday watching the developer <laughs> keynote, and I was like, this is really cool, like integrated right into your developer tooling, having that AI kind of experience helping you be a more efficient developer so yeah it's super exciting to see what's happening there i need to go play with it because i just saw it <laughs> yesterday i'm like okay now I, I gotta go actually try this stuff and, and that, dive that in. this but happened to me in a similar role you the company announces something you go i gotta play with this so i know what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah yeah so at this point all i've seen is the demo it looked really amazing now i need to actually get my hands on it and, okay and you, you it, can but... test if it's actually as good as the demo where <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it was a live demo which i was like hey you know like like 
I, I'm a huge fan of live demos. I'm like, if it works in a live demo, there's a, a better chance that it's going to work for me while I'm sitting in front of my computer. Whereas I'm always a little leery of like the, the pre-canned, you know, pre-recorded demos. I'm like, yeah. okay, that to me is like a red flag that the path is not going to be as smooth <laughs> for me as the user. Yeah. yeah. If you do a live demo, it, it proves you're prepared to put something on the line for reliability yeah, yeah. right yeah 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 exactly. so final question then um if someone wants to get started with kotlin are you recommending they start with android studio or what, what's my what's my onboarding path yeah so i think it depends on which platform you want to start building for if you want to start building for android then android studio is going to be the right path there uh if you want to start with other platforms then um you can just get intellij the community edition is free and start writing kotlin code uh they've got some wizards to to build out new new projects and all that um and then for kotlin multi-platform uh you can also start you know intellij and, and start creating multi-platform projects projects and and targeting other other operating systems um and then the kotlin ling website has all sorts of great getting started learning material and all that for people okay. that want to dive in um but yeah lots lots of resources out there depending on uh, you know what people want to do but but maybe to your point uh it depends on which platform you're interested in targeting for kind of what your entry point is into it um and some some different options there okay that's that's a new one actually where it where you're compiling to makes a difference to how you get started <laughs> that is yeah that is interesting so if you're a server-side developer uh and spring is a great choice to start with with kotlin and so go to start.spring.io you can click kotlin as the language and boom you're like get your starter project and can start writing kotlin code for spring so yeah kind of a few different entry points depending on what what you want to build um but yeah, lots of lots of great resources out there for developers to learn. Okay, cool. I'm going to append Kotlin to my list of things to learn. <laughs> yeah, let me know how it goes. Yeah, I'd love I will. To, to make sure that that getting started experience is great for you, Chris. Because if it's great for you, then, then you know, maybe it's great for everyone. <laughs> well, work on Emacs support, dude. <laughs> yeah, <there laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that. I take that back. <laughs> There are bigger issues uh, than editor choice. Uh, I know. Yeah, it's it. You know, it is wild in this this space that we have a lot of different options for how we write our code, and and um and you know, I think it is important that we support everyone and their choices around that. So, yeah, hopefully we'll get that, that space continues to evolve. One challenge at a time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> James, pleasure talking to you as always. I hope I see yeah, you again soon. You, and thanks for joining yeah, us. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, James. As you just heard, James is the co-host of his own podcast called Happy Path Programming. So if you're interested in a bit of a role reversal, there's an episode on there where I go and tell him all about my love of Haskell. I'll link to it in the show notes. So if you really want, you can get two languages for the price of one this week. Value. That's value, eh? If you'd like to give a smidgen of that value back, please take a moment to like and subscribe. I know everyone asks, but I'm also asking because it genuinely does help. Or just drop me a comment. I'm doing this because I'm a developer who loves talking to developers. So come and say hi. There should be a comment box nearby, or if not, my links are in the show notes. You can get in touch with me. And with that, I think we've written one and it's time for me to run elsewhere. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with James Ward. Thanks for listening.